I realize that most Western Gentile Christians were raised with the notion that Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. So was I. It is as much a part of Western Christian culture as Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and Halloween. Yeshua's baptism begins an unbroken chain of events that follows Yeshua for the next 70 weeks, 490 days. Living in Israel for 20 years and the Galilee for the past 12, I know the ancient Roman roads and cart paths that still link the villages of Israel today. I know how long it takes to walk from one point to another. In this series, we will follow Yeshua's travels as detailed by all four gospel authors. These accounts are without error or contradiction, but sometimes they contradict the impressions we inherited from our religious systems and Hollywood. I realize that most Western Gentile Christians were raised with the notion that Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. So was I. It is as much a part of Western Christian culture as Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and Halloween. And just as contrived as forcing Yeshua's three days and three nights in the grave into the pagan festivals of Dagon, the Assyrian fish god Friday, and Easter, the Babylonian sex goddess Sunday. What I didn't know until after more than 30 years of historical and biblical research was that one man in the fourth century fabricated a three and a half year ministry of Jesus out of the thin blue sky. For more than 300 years, there was not one dissenting opinion voiced among the early church historians or the disciples of the disciples of Yeshua himself that Jesus' ministry was about one year. In the fourth century, one man, the court bishop of Constantine, was attempting to decipher the enigmatic 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, a prophecy that even Sir Isaac Newton was unable to solve. His solution? He said Jesus' ministry was three and a half years, which is one half of a week. Since when is three and a half years one half of a week? It immediately alerts the Bible student that Eusebius was attempting to decipher Daniel's 70-week prophecy. It was a wild and unsupportable assumption that ignored more than 300 years of unchallenged testimony from the sapient witnesses. Eusebius was futilely attempting to get the final seven years of Daniel's prophecy fulfilled so that Constantine, a biblically illiterate, Mithra-worshipping pagan, could supposedly reign as the vicar of Christ from his millennial throne. Denying more than 300 years of unified testimony, Eusebius came up with a hypothesis which is not only unprovable, it completely destroyed any possibility of understanding the gospel narrative. We are left with faith-shaking contradictions as two entire years of dead silence are imaginatively inserted into the gospel record. In the century following Eusebius, scribes inserted eight words into later copies of Greek text attempting to legitimize his unique eisegetic interpretation. Those eight words added a fictitious feast of Passover in the sixth chapter of John at the time of the feeding of the 5,000, at the end of the summer. But Passover is six months later in the spring. The next event in the seventh chapter of John is the Feast of Tabernacles, again, six months after Passover. The other gospels have the feeding of the 5,000 at the end of the summer, and they are on their way up to the Feast of Tabernacles in the same chapter, the very next week. Neither Yeshua, the population of the Galilee, nor the Pharisees are at Jerusalem for this fictitious Passover of John chapter six, verse four. By adding a Passover at the time of the feeding of the 5,000, an entire year of dead silence is introduced into the gospel record. All of the early church fathers and historians of the first three centuries either stated plainly or never contradicted that Jesus' ministry was about one year. Yeshua goes up to Passover in John chapter two when he meets with Nicodemus. He goes up to Passover in John chapter 12 when he was crucified. It would take a little more than one year to fulfill those two Passovers. 
If the historians and church fathers of the first three centuries had a third Passover in their text of John, none could have been so foolish as to not understand that it would have taken well over two years to fulfill three Passovers. Yet they all said his ministry was about one year. Copies of manuscripts that predate the Eusebian forgeries still exist in museums. In these ancient manuscripts, there is no Passover in John chapter six. No one goes up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of John 6, 4. Yeshua feeds 5,000, and then four days later, another 4,000 with leavened barley loaves during what would have been the Feast of Unleavened Bread, matzah. The Capernaum synagogue was packed with those who do not go up to a feast. That week, Pharisees come down from Jerusalem to challenge Yeshua on why none of his thousands of disciples were washing their hands with the two-handled Negelvesser before they ate leavened bread. No one goes to Jerusalem for this phantom Passover feast because it was added to the text by Gentiles who know nothing about the feast of the Lord. Any Jew could see right through their charade if they bothered to read the text and think. There's no question among Bible scholars, it is a well-known fact that words and phrases have been added and removed from various texts of the Gospels and epistles to support the positions of theologians of past millennia. This one book gives me access to more than 5,000 manuscripts, and it documents more than 250,000 variations. I have spent more than 45 years analyzing those variations, and I have solved every apparent contradiction in the Gospels. But it took more than 40 years to do so. Today, the text of the Bible is ignored. Sheep will swallow whatever they are fed by their shepherds. They don't even read the scriptures in their own language, much less investigate the manuscripts of antiquity. Our goal is to get to the truth not defend ours or anyone else's denominational predispositions. If our interpretation destroys the continuity of the scriptures, it is our interpretation that is an error, not the words of the men of God who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Shalom Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.